So as uh, more and more people join us, um, let me start the proceedings today, uh, welcoming you um, in this uh, gathering all, all the new friends. And I'm very, very pleased to see actually some of the old friends uh, that I see uh, in the screen. Um, this is the continued series of discussions organized by the Athens Public International Law Center. Uh, for those of you who uh, do not know me, I'm Maria Ornelli. Um, I'm a member of the faculty of the center, and indeed member of the faculty of law at the University of Athens. But, uh, and this is a wonderful way to advertise the new project that we run. Um, we also have a new Refugee and Migration Studies Hub at the University of Athens uh, that uh, was supposed to take its time and uh, discuss uh, migratory flows at its leisure. And then uh, Ukraine came upon us and uh, no leisure anymore, but it seems that we are at the thick of things. So um, we are very, very pleased to have uh, among us today, Professor Marko Milanovic, uh, a very old friend, a very good friend. Um, welcome. Uh, Professor Milanovic, for those of you who, I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, he's a professor of public international law uh, and co-director of the Human Rights Law Center at the University of Nottingham Law School. Um, he has been writing uh, at Agile Talk, being one of the co-editors, but recently I don't think that there's anything being done on Ukraine, especially that Marco has not signed on it. Um, he has been working in the field for quite some time, including as a member of uh, the Committee of High Level Experts who would assist uh, the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights on questions of uh, human rights violations in Belarus. Um, we were thinking in Belarus and we ended up with Ukraine and just about everybody else. He is also very much involved with the uh, latest edition of the Tallinn Manual, uh, working on issues of uh, what do we call that cyber force these days. <laughs> so it's really uh, a situation that merits further uh, consideration, I think. So uh, I'm sure that uh, with Mark on board and on the other side as discussant, Professor Linus Alexandre Sicilianus, uh, who is now the Dean of the uh, Athens Law School, um, having just returned from uh, Strasbourg where he was the president of the European Court of Human Rights. I'm sure that we're in for a very exciting evening. Uh, but uh, before I give the floor to Marco and invite all of you to um, find out more about international law in Ukraine. Professor Fotin Pazadzis, who is the director of Athens Bill, is here among us. Uh, Faye. So greetings to everyone and thank you very much, Maria, for um, taking over. Uh, I just want to add my voice to yours. First of all, to greet the many participants we have in this series. And I'm sure the large number is due, of course, to our very famous Marko Milanovic, uh, who we know as a colleague, a friend, uh, and also as you know, the, the steadfast uh, contributor to the Agile blog, uh, among others. And so it's a great pleasure to have Marko uh, Milanovic with us. Maria, you did the introduction. There's not much more to be said. Very well-known scholar, and of course, former member of the board of the European uh, Society of International uh, Law. And the, the pleasure is also, for, of course, for us uh, within Athens PIL to have a great discussant, as discussant tonight, my, uh, our dear colleague uh, and former president of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Alexander uh, Sicilianos. So uh, this will be a moment, I think, that is important and in view especially of what is currently uh, happening uh, in um, the eastern part of Europe, uh, we really had to add uh, our voice and hear, hear from someone who's been writing from the beginning um, to hear and to discuss about international law and the war in Ukraine. So welcome, Marco. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Maria, for taking over. 
thank you. Uh, not at all, thank you. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure, as they say. Um, Faye continues with her participation at the board meeting of the European Society of International Law, so she will be uh, following up on mute. Uh, but uh, there's nothing mute uh, about Marko Milanovic, and uh, it is my great pleasure to give you the star of the evening. Marko, we're all ears. Well, well, thank you, Maria. Uh, uh, thank you, Faye. Hey, thank you, Alexander. Uh, also, in particular, it's such a pleasure to be with you tonight, and, and, and thank you very much for inviting me, and I hope we, we have an interesting uh, uh, couple of hours or whatever, how, how long we're going to have talking about international law in Ukraine. Um, the, the, the topic we've chosen is, is very broad, international law and, and the war in Ukraine, which is everything, right? And we deliberately chose it that way in order to sort of allow for developments and to, to sort of see what's going to, going to be happening, right, over the, over the past several weeks. Um, so I, I will really try to do a sort of tour de raison uh, and, and look at various different issues and then focus uh, on, a, on, a, on a few select more recent topics in, in, in a bit more detail. So if we're talking about international law in Ukraine and the, the current crisis, we can really discuss this in at least three different ways. We can talk about the various rules of international law. Are the rules being broken? Are they reasonably clear? How are they being applied? How are they being invoked? We can talk about enforcement, the various enforcement mechanisms that international law has at its disposal from courts to UN Special Rapporteurs and the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights to sanctions, right? And then we can talk on, on a macro scale about the story sort of, of our own system, our, our own profession. You know, is the current crisis a failure of international law, a failure of international legal system, or is it some kind of non-failure at the very minimum? Okay, so Obviously, this is not something that can be done in, in 25 minutes, which is what I will be taking. So what I will focus on really is the, is the issue of the rules and a bit about the enforcement. The grand story of failure or non-failure has been told so many times in so many different crises that I really don't want to dwell on it. The fact that a powerful state is, being, is able to violate international law is nothing new. Just like in domestic law, the fact that a powerful individual can violate domestic law is nothing new. It's literally the constant of the human experience for thousands of years. Ever since there have been laws, people have been breaking bonds. The issue is what do we do about it? Yeah. So I will not really talk too much about this grand theme, you know, has the post-World War II order failed? Has the Cold War order failed? Whatever. I mean, we can discuss it if you want, but in a sense, it's nothing new. And of course it links very, very greatly to prior violations of international law and the use and bellum in particular by Western states. And, and that's something we can discuss if you'd like as well. So let me then turn to the, the first body of rules that, that I will talk about, which is the use of bellum, the, the law and the use of force. Here, I think the situation is reasonably straightforward. I don't see how a reasonable international lawyer can make an argument that what Russia is doing is lawful. I just said basically that whoever said it's lawful is unreasonable, but that's true, okay? The law is clear. The facts maybe are a bit more contested, but on the facts as we know them, it is clear that Russia is violating the prohibition of the use of force in Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter. The arguments that Russia itself gave for using force are more or less completely implausible. They stem from a speech that President Putin made on the eve of the invasion. That speech was later circulated as an Article 51 letter to the Security Council and was later annexed to Russia's submission to the International Court of Justice in, a, in the pending case that we all know about. In that speech, President Putin basically said, we're using force in self-defense. Ukraine was attacking Russia and Russia was attacking itself. Yeah? I mean, only uttering those words shows how nonsensical the argument is. 
And it has two variants. One is that Russia was somehow defending itself from a future threat by Ukraine in some exercise of preventive, preemptive self-defense. This echoes, by the way, the Bush administration's arguments with regard to Iraq, where one strand of the argument being made was that the, U the US had the right of self-defense against Iraq because Iraq might be developing a weapon of might mass destruction that in some point in the future, it might give to terrorists. Now that argument then was regarded as so implausible that not even the closest ally of the United States, the British government espoused it. On the contrary, the British Attorney General Lord Goldsmith in his opinion authorizing the invasion of Iraq actually said, this argument is essentially so stupid, there is no way to embrace it. And in fact, the American government did not formally make it. The American government for invading Iraq, uh, argument for invading Iraq, like the British argument for invading Iraq was implicit authorization by the Security Council. So the preventive self-defense argument cannot we cannot have an international legal order prohibiting the use of force, whereby simply some kind of future threat is enough to authorize use of force in self-defense, okay? The second argument is essentially one of collective self-defense, that Russia is defending these two new states from an armed attack by Ukraine. Now, even if you assume that these entities are states and they're not, and that Ukraine was attacking them, you still would need to comply with necessity and proportionality criteria. And no reasonable argument can be made that invading all of Ukraine, leveling its cities to the earth, is necessary and proportionate as collective self-defense of Donetsk and Luhansk. So basically, if you were a student of international law and you made an, an argument saying that what Russia is doing in Ukraine is legal, you would be failing the exam. There is no plausible way of arguing that what Russia did is legal. Now we can contrast that actually with the American invasion of Iraq and then the UK invasion of Iraq, where, you know, I am and 90% of international lawyers would say, you know, what they did was unlawful, but the argument about implied security council of the had something to it. It's not a completely stupid argument. Yeah. Um, maybe it was made as cynically, as Russia has made its self-defense argument now, but you know it was it was it was as bad probably in some respects, but not as bad at least in its formal plausibility. Okay, so so much so about the use ad valum. I think the law is clear, and it's clear that Russia violated. When it comes to IHL, the use in bellow, I would say the same is true. Yes, there are many complicated questions about, for example whether Ukrainian uh, citizens taking up arms against Russia are civilians directly participating in hostilities or are a militia that enjoys combatant status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are complicated questions about whether cyber partisans engaging in acts against Russia are participating in hostilities. But 99% of the rules that should be applied in this conflict are clear. The principles of distinction and proportionality. And it is clear, as much as anything can be clear, that Russia is deliberately targeting civilians, which is simply unlawful, a categorical violation of IHL. Now, if you pick one in any individual case of use of force in, in Ukraine, from bombing the TV tower in Kiev to bombing uh, you know, maternal hospitals in, in Mariupol, whatever, you know, you could make, it would be difficult to establish whether any given specific attack was intended by Russia to target civilians. To do that, we would really need to know what the commander wanted at the time. You know, we would really need to examine what the Russian commander wanted to achieve. But if you look at the big picture of what Russia is doing, in particular, the use of rocket artillery on populated areas, and if you look at what, for example, Mariupol looks like now, there is simply no doubt that Russia was targeting civilians deliberately and or was using indiscriminate weapons in that particular context. And there is again, nothing terribly complicated 
about these rules of IHL as they are being applied or can be applied to these particular situations, even though we know there are many complexities in IHL. Just like in Syria, where you have a completely devastated country, you know, the reason why that country was devastated was not because the use and bell of the, uh, the, the international humanitarian law was unclear or could be interpreted multiple ways. So it is the case here. It's not like Russia you know, is exploiting ambiguities in IHL in what it's doing, it's simply violating IHL. Okay. Now that leads us directly to international criminal law. Um, it is very clear that at least some war crimes have been committed on the territory of Ukraine. Who is responsible for these war crimes is of course a much more complicated issue and one, not one that I will get into. As you know, the ICC has jurisdiction over Ukraine by virtue of Ukraine's ad hoc declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the court. And the prosecutor is investigating after a referral from a whole bunch of states. We shall find out, yeah. Um, one particularly interesting issue of international criminal law is not whether Russian individuals are guilty of committing a, a war crimes. It's whether its leadership is individually responsible for committing the crime of aggression. Now, if you look at Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute, which cannot be applied to Russia under the jurisdictional regime of the statute, without a Security Council referral, which as you know, will not happen. But if you look at Article 8 bis, you will see that it's a product of, some people would say a rotten compromise in which Western states in particular did their very, very best to narrow down the scope of the crime as much as possible and to introduce weaselly words into the formulation of the crime to basically allow only the most obvious instances of aggression to be prosecutable by the ICC. So in particular, Article 8, 8 bis requires an act of aggression, which is something committed by a state, to be a manifest violation of the UN Charter by its character, gravity, and scale. That language was introduced so that, for example, a British gen general or a British prime minister could argue that the NATO attack on Serbia in 1999 was not aggression, or that the invasion of Iraq was not aggression because plausible arguments could be made that it was lawful. And government lawyers did make those plausible arguments. But even with that weaselly language, that can be interpreted in many ways, character, gravity, scale, a manifest violation of the charter. If what Russia is doing is not a manifest violation of the charter, I don't know what is. Yeah. So even under that very narrow definition of the crime of aggression, that is exactly what President Putin seems to have committed. Paradoxically, prosecuting President Putin and or his henchmen for the crime of aggression would be much easier if you could get them into the courtroom than prosecuting them for war crimes. To prosecute high level leaders for war crimes, you need so-called linkage evidence that shows that they controlled, directed crimes committed many, many levels down the hierarchy on the ground. And that is very difficult, right? The crime of aggression on the other hand is a leadership crime. Only the leadership of the state can commit it. The regular soldier individual cannot. And if you establish that what Russia did was a manifest violation of the UN Charter and that the leadership had the adequate level of mens rea, you can have a trial finished within a week. It's not something complicated to do. Of course, it will never happen. So despite all the nice words about, you know, having a special tribunal for the crime of aggression, the odds of Putin et al ending up in the dock for that particular crime are minuscule. That can only happen if there is regime change in Russia, which is very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely. And Russia decides to, to cooperate with any such tribunal. I mean, the odds are astronomically low. That doesn't mean the effort is not worth doing, maybe. 
I don't know, we can discuss this, but let's not kid ourselves that 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 Putin will, will end up in The Hague um, for aggression or for war crimes. Um, just like Blair and, and Bush did not end up in any court for their aggression against Iraq. And in fact, are respected members of society, which is sort of the, a, a problem of the West, if you will, if you will, to, to, to sort itself out. Yeah. Then we have genocide. And the very interesting proceedings initiated by Ukraine against Russia before the ICJ. And Matina, for example, has written about this on, 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 on Egil Talk. Um, we have witnessed a very creative use of this, this particular treaty, which as you know, vests the ICJ with jurisdiction uh, under Article 9 of the convention for uh, uh, the commission of any, uh, of any uh, uh, wrongful acts under the treaty, including state responsibility for genocide. Ukraine basically has argued before the court that it has a right not to be subjected to an unlawful use of force on the basis of a false accusation that it has committed genocide against Russians or Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine. Now, as you know, the court found that argument to be plausible. It is something like a defamation argument. Every state sort of has the right not to be slandered that it's committing genocide, but then upgraded, not simply being subjected to a false accusation, but not having force used against it on the basis of that false accusation. And at least at the provisional measures uh, stage, the court found that argument to be plausible by 13 votes to two. We may expect that at the jurisdiction stage, a couple of judges will, will be saying actually on a deeper look, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to litigate the use ad bellum under the guise of the Genocide Convention, which is actually true. Now, that is what Ukraine is doing. And we can expect you know, more judges to vote no when it comes to the issue of jurisdiction whenever that gets decided a year or two from now, God knows. This is by the way, what exactly what happened when Serbia, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia as it then was, launched proceedings under the Genocide Convention in 1999 in the so-called legality of the use of force cases, where the court basically said, come on, there's simply no, no reasonable argument that can be made that NATO is committing genocide against Serbia. What you're trying to do is litigate the use of the But Ukraine, unlike Serbia in that case, succeeded on the provisional measure stage and is very likely to succeed on the jurisdictional stage as well because it made this creative reversed argument. It's not accusing Russia of committing genocide, at least not for the moment. It is accusing Russia of using force against it on the basis of a false accusation of genocide. Whoever made up that argument, good for them. You know, that's what good international lawyers do. And, and um, you know, it resulted in the ICJ issuing probably the strongest provisional measures order it has ever issued in a case involving the interstate use of force for whatever that's worth. Now, finally, the last sort of area of international law that I want to talk about is the European Convention on Human Rights. There, Ukraine has, since the start of the conflict, the wider conflict in 2014, already launched 10 cases against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights, alleging all sorts of violations from the situation in Crimea to the downing of the MH17, uh, a case in which it was joined later by the Netherlands to all sorts of violations in Eastern Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Last year, Russia, in an interesting twist, filed its own case against Ukraine. The first time Russia has done this, in part alleging that Ukraine was responsible for the destruction of the MH17 because it failed to close the airspace. Yeah. Now, the court has been dealing with these cases at sort of an increasing pace. Of course, all the interstate cases are accompanied by thousands of individual applications. It has delivered on the, the presidency of Alexander, who's present here, 
it has delivered its jurisdictional uh, uh, decision in the Crimea case, where it found that Russia controlled Crimea, not simply from the moment of its incorporation and accession into the Russian Federation, but essentially from the moment the little green men uh, uh, took over the, the province. In January, the court heard oral arguments in the MH17 Eastern Ukraine case. And I mean, the events obviously have overtaken it, but we could probably assume that the court will deliver its decision this year, right? Uh, most of the other cases, of course, have not yet reached the, the, uh, the, 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 the formal examination stage. Now, the very last case that was filed uh, as the conflict the, the, this year started had as its main purpose, like the ICJ proceedings, for the European Court to issue interim measures, which it did under the Rule 39 of the, of the court's rules. But the scope of this case is potentially enormous, right? It covers essentially the entirety of the conflict as it is being fought. Now, all of these cases are being filed in the shadow of many other decisions of the European Court that deal with the applicability of the convention extraterritorially. So in situations when the state acts outside its territory and in situations of armed conflict. The two often overlap, but need not overlap. So the question of extraterritoriality arises, for example, in peacetime as well. If British intelligence agencies intercept Alexander's email while he's in Athens, there's no armed conflict issue, but the question still arises whether he has the right to privacy vis-a-vis -vis the United Kingdom when he sits in Athens. You see what I mean? The armed conflict problem does not simply arise extraterritorially, it also rises within a state's territory. From Ukraine's perspective, the entire conflict is taking place on its own territory. From Azerbaijan's perspective, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict was fought within its own territory. And as you know, last year, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey are also litigating the Nagorno-Karabakh case in the European court. Now, the court's approach to both of these questions, which often arise in combination, has been, to put it charitably, complicated, confusing, inconsistent. And a lot of this confusion stems from a case that deals with the, the 1999 NATO bombing of Serbia, the Bankovic decision, with, where the court in December 2001, a few months after 9-11, just as the invasion of Afghanistan by, by the Western powers was starting, essentially said, so long as you bomb people and you don't have troops on the ground, the European Convention won't apply. The victims of the bombing, etc., will not be within the jurisdiction of the bombing state under Article 1 of the Convention. Now, there have been many, many developments since domestically in the European court, both the conduct of, 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 of US UK troops in Iraq and in Afghanistan has been litigated extensively. There have been many revisions sort of to the court's approach and challenges to the court's approach. Its latest word on this, as you all know, came last year in probably what we could call an improvident decision in Georgia, Russia number two, that deals with the 2008 conflict um, in Georgia. Now, in that decision, um, the court really took what can be described as a purely pragmatic policy-oriented approach, something I, by the way, completely sympathize with. It said, more or less, how are we going to be able to determine who killed whom and in what way in a context of chaos in an active hostilities phase of an international armed conflict. Can a judge in Strasbourg really establish whether, you know, a Russian artillery gun bombing place X in a city near in Georgia 
followed the rules of IHL, and in doing so, did or did not violate the right to life under the convention. So essentially the court said, look, don't come to us when it comes to these uses of kinetic force in armed conflict. We don't have the mandate to do this. We don't have the expertise to do this. We can't establish the facts, go away. We will do some things, however. So the court said the convention will apply to anyone detained in the conflict, whether a combatant or a civilian, whether detained in the active hostilities phase of the conflict or after it. And the court also said, and this is actually a progress compared to the Bankovic decision, the positive duty to investigate violations of the right to life continues to apply. Even if the substantive duty, weirdly, does not. Now, if you applied this approach of the court to what is going on in Ukraine, we would be left with, with a rather morally, politically unacceptable position. That the vast majority of the horrors that Russia is now inflicting on the people of Ukraine are not a human rights problem. That when you see Mariupol, every building in the city damaged, that, well, this is a context of chaos and we don't have a violation of either the right to life or the right to property or the right to private life, whatever. Yeah. That is what Georgia Russia number two could essentially do if applied consistently by the court, but it won't be. So if I was a betting man, if and when the European court starts examining these issues, and I'll come to this in a second, it will likely depart from Georgia Russia number two simply because it's unpalatable for it to say that killing thousands of people in a city, shelling them incessantly by artillery is not a human rights issue. Yeah. So the court will deviate from that, but that will have systemic consequences for everything else that the court has wanted to avoid for so very long, including all the Western misadventures, drones, the war on terror, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we shall see. Now, if and when that moment of reckoning comes, the court will have to make some serious choices. One choice it will have to make is whether to simply reinvent its extraterritoriality jurisprudence from the ground and say, whenever you kill somebody, they have the right to life. Whenever the negative duty to respect is implicated, it applies. This is essentially the approach that has now been embraced by the Human Rights Committee in its General Comment 36. So that's one issue. A second issue, which paradoxically might make things both easier and harder for the court, is how it will conceptualize the relationship between the use ad bellum and the European Convention. Now we have talked a lot over the past few decades about the relationship between IHL and human rights, Lex Specialis, all those things. But in Gel Common 36, the committee said, every use of force, every loss of life that results from an act of aggression is ipso facto a violation of the right to life. So if you applied that approach to what Russia is doing now in Ukraine, Every Ukrainian soldier, every Ukrainian civilian killed during the conflict would be a victim of a violation of the right to life. Even if their killing was in line with IHL, for example, they were a combatant. Now, I have argued in my prior work that this is probably not a very wise approach to take because it would mean that human rights bodies will have to make decisions on the ad bellum legality of uses of force. And that it's probably wiser to insulate human rights law from the use ad bellum, just like we insulate IHL from the use ad bellum. But the Human Rights Committee has decided otherwise. It, by the way, will also be getting cases dealing with the conflict and we shall see what it says there. And there will be a great temptation for the court 
to take that same route. If it takes that route, it doesn't have to really get into the facts, the very complicated facts in any detail. It doesn't have to look at the mindset of any Russian soldier in whom they were targeting, were they pursuing a military target or a civilian target, none of that. It can simply say it was aggression, therefore the right to life is ipso facto violated, maybe all other human rights under the convention are ipso facto violated. So I, I can foresee sort of a great deal of temptation there for the court. If it was me, I would say, don't take that route, but maybe they will. Another big item of uncertainty is the issue of derogation. So as you know, Russia has not derogated from the convention, but Ukraine has. One specific derogation was not made, however. And if you look at Article 15, Paragraph 2, it, it says that there shall be no derogation from the right to life except in respect of deaths resulting from lawful acts of war. No state has ever done this. Now, one big question that remains to be resolved is what the effect of this provision is actually going to be. Will the court simply say, well, the fact that nobody has ever done it means that it has fallen into desuetude and we have to apply IHL and human rights together and that's it. Or whether it'll say, well, in the absence of a derogation, there's a violation of the right to life and that's it, we shall see. Now I will conclude just on the final practical point. As you know, Russia has been expelled from the Council of Europe on the 16th of March. Uh, a week later, the European court met in plenary session and in clear coordination with the committee of ministers. And it decided that actually Russia will only cease being a party to the convention on the 16th of September, 2022, six months after its departure from the Council of Europe. Um, this relates to what, what is a very interesting issue of how Article 58 of the convention, specifically its third paragraph, is to be interpreted. And there are multiple linguistical and policy reasons why you could interpret Article 58.3 as saying that upon expulsion, a state immediately ceases being a, a party to the convention or ceases to be a party six months later. Yeah, the court opted for the second approach. I, I am sure that the 47 judges had vigorous disagreement on this, but still two thirds of them must have said, actually, it'll be September. And the committee of ministers said, great. Now, the consequence of that is that the entirety of the war is covered by the convention, all of it. And people affected by Russia's actions, not just in Ukraine, but also in Russia. Think, for example, Russian soldiers, families of Russian soldiers who are not being told by their government how their children died. Anti-war protesters in Moscow being arrested in their thousands being subjected to prosecution for simply speaking the truth. Yeah? All these people will be able to make applications to the European court. And the court will be confronted with this enormous challenge of processing these and already the 15, I don't know how many thousand pending cases against Russia in a reasonably effective way with the resources it has. Now, I have no idea how they will do it. Certainly if member states have any you know, ounce of reason in them, they need to pump millions of euros into the court to make this effort even, even potentially feasible. But there will be great practical difficulties nonetheless, especially because Russia will not participate almost certainly. And the European court has never really had to deal with an issue of a respondent state systematically refusing to participate in proceedings before it. So it'll be very interesting to see what the court does in that regard and whether, for example, it resorts to default judgments, saying to Russia, you didn't contest, therefore we will accept all the facts as, as alleged by the applicants as established, for example. So we shall see. So anyway, that sort of ends my run through all the various different topics of international law. And of course, I'm very, very happy to hear what Alexander has to say about this and to, to have a chat about this. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, that was a tour de force rather than a tour de raison. But uh, it is also, to a certain extent, um, international law triumphant. 
So I will just pass the, bat pass the baton to, to Dean Sicilianos and ask Lina to just go ahead with questions in the hope of answers. <laughs> thank you so much. So thank you very much, Maria, and thank you very much uh, to Marco. I was uh, sure beforehand that he would make a brilliant presentation as he did. And uh, I must confess that uh, I agree with him, not totally, but on a number of issues. Um, as far as the, I shall try to follow a little bit his, his uh, expose, and then I shall add some more points uh, for discussion. Uh, as far as the rules are concerned, and, and you said Bellum is concerned, uh, I very much agree with uh, what uh, Marco has just said. I would like to remind a very interesting passage from the Nicaragua case, uh, saying in substance that when a state is invoking an exception within the law, uh, then the prohibition of the use of force is actually reinforced rather than weakened. And uh, as Marco said, the main argument which has been invoked in this case was the self-defense argument which is an exception to the prohibition to the use of force, which is in the law. It is, uh, it is within the law. So we are squarely uh, within the framework, the conceptual framework of the ICJ in this old case. And I think that the uh, order of the 16th of March uh, is alluding to this, uh, to this uh, conceptual approach. Um, so uh, the argument made by President Putin, according to which this was a self-defense or a collective self-defense, uh, permits uh, the International Court of Justice and, and, and permits us as international lawyers to say that this case is not, uh, how to say, a, a real danger to the very foundation of the United Nations, because this is a foundational uh, um, a prohibition. This is something which is uh, the major contribution of the United States and the United Nations to the humanity. Uh, so we, we have had this whole issue and this whole problem uh, during the um, Iraqi uh, intervention. We have had this whole issue uh, um, in 1999. I think that uh, uh, the passage uh, from the ICJ judgment uh, in June 1986 in Nicaragua is helpful in order to uh, understand how all this functions. And uh, it is helpful to, to reply to uh, non-international lawyers when they say that international law and the prohibition to use force is uh, simply an unrealistic uh, uh, rule. Um, my uh, second observation uh, is to say that I very much agree with what Marco said about uh, uh, the use uh, in Bello and the violation of the principle of distinction and the targeting of uh, uh, civilians, as well as the parallel with, with Syria. Uh, now, within, when it comes to the um, ICC, I was very much interested uh, by uh, by the way, uh, Prosecutor uh, Karim Khan has handled the issue. We all know that he has visited uh, Ukraine, uh, that he has adopted, he has made two statements, very interesting statements, the one on the 28th of February and the uh, second one on the uh, 2nd of March. And uh, uh, he has also visited Poland. He has uh, spoken uh, uh, with uh, the president of uh, Ukraine, with uh, other officials on the Ukraine, and he has opened an investigation on possible breaches of the Rome statutes. Uh, he has received uh, a number of referrals, more than 40 uh, uh, nowadays. And uh, the investigation is, does not concern only the actual phase of hostilities. It goes back to the 21st of November uh, 2013, encompassing, says the prosecutor, uh, past and present allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity and aggression. So this is a, a huge, a huge uh, uh, um, investigation. This uh, will be a huge investigation. Uh, if I may, I would like also to recall that the European Court of Human Rights was mentioning in the um, judgment uh, uh, Marco referred to 
uh, concerning the Crimean case mentioned the investigation already done uh, by the ICC in respect of what has happened uh, in Crimea back in 2014. So the whole scope, the whole framework does not concern only what's happening now, it's going back uh, to 2013, and this is extremely um, uh, interesting, but at the same time, extremely challenging for the uh, uh, ICC. Um, as far as uh, uh, genocide and the genocide convention is concerned, I would like also to uh, highlight here that uh, two major human rights instruments have been recently uh, invoked as a basis of jurisdiction of the ICJ. Uh, the Genocide Convention, the on one hand, and on the other hand, the ISA, the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and this is the basis of jurisdiction invoked by Ukraine in the uh, other case uh, uh, versus Russia, namely the one concerning uh, uh, Crimea. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, up until recently, it was almost unthinkable that uh, uh, those human rights instruments uh, which uh, uh, provide for interstate applications would ever be applied. And in fact, they are, and they are in a quite uh, um, uh, uh, impressive uh, way um, in, in a bunch of cases pending now uh, before the International Court of Justice. Um, which makes the International Court of Justice, I would dare say, a human rights court, but nevertheless a, a court dealing extensively with grave human rights uh, violations. Um, so this is, this is a nuance that I would like to, to add to what uh, uh, Marco said uh, in this respect. Now, coming to uh, the European uh, Court of uh, Human Rights. Well, uh, we... Um, Many of, uh, uh, of you are aware uh, about the possible agreements and disagreements between uh, Mark and myself on the issue of uh, extraterritorial application of uh, human rights. I'm not going to uh, defend the court. My purpose is not to defend the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that, uh, yes, in Georgia versus Russia too, this was a pragmatically oriented approach uh, we shall see whether uh, the court is likely to depart from this approach in the present case. I wouldn't bet, Marco. Um, I, I'm not sure at all uh, that uh, the court will depart from this approach. Which approach was based actually on al versus the United Kingdom? Because what the court has said in uh, uh, Georgia versus Russia number two uh, the court said simply that the, the two scenarios envisaged in al are not applicable in the present case. Uh, it said that there is no effective control over an area because by definition, when you are in the active phase of hostilities, there is no control. And it said also that the control over a person uh, is not necessarily applicable. So the, the court has invented nothing in, in Georgia versus Russia number two. It has at least apparently, uh, and I get your argument uh, here, but I say at least apparently it uh, is applying uh, uh, the same approach as in Alskane. Of course, as uh, uh, Marco rightly said, uh, there is an underlying argument which is alluded to in Georgia versus Russia, namely that the European Court of Human Rights is not a war court. And um, apparently the European Court does not want to be a, a war uh, uh, court. So uh, uh, as Marco, uh, I am very curious to see how my former colleagues will go ahead with uh, uh, this case, and especially how they are going to go ahead with the relationship between uh, um, the European uh, Convention and the use of Bell. Uh, I respectfully uh, disagree with the Human Rights Committee as far as the general comment approach, uh, uh, general comment number 36 approach is concerned. I think that uh, um, it is preferable to take uh, the ICJ approach when it comes to the relationship between uh, um, use at bellum, use in bello, uh, human rights, uh, international humanitarian law, uh, it is a, a, a wiser uh, approach.
Now, as far as the uh, expulsion of Russia is concerned and the denunciation by Russian Federation of the European Court, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, because we have both. On the 15th of March, there has been a notification to the Committee of Ministers according to which the Russian Federation expressed its intention to denounce the European Convention of Human Rights on the basis of the terms provided for in Article 58 of the Convention. And Article 58 of the, the Convention provides that any denunciation is not automatic. Uh, you cannot just uh, leave the system within 24 hours. You have to continue to accept cases within a period for at least within a period of, uh, uh, for a period of uh, six months. And, and this is not an automatic uh, um, uh, act, unilateral act. And then it goes on and it says, that this applies uh, the same way with the same legal consequences in case of an expulsion, in case a, a contracting party to the convention ceases to be a member of uh, the Council of Europe. So I think that uh, there was no other solution, uh, uh, Marco, than to arrive to this solution, which is a, an extremely challenging solution for the court. I very much agree with you, but uh, based not on, only on the uh, letter, but also on the spirit of Article 58, there was no other solution. We have a precedent, uh, just one precedent that I would like to recall, and this is the uh, expulsion of uh, uh, Greece from the Council of Europe back in 1969. Uh, there is a precedent, but uh, I would like also to recall but that by that time, Greece did, had not accepted the jurisdiction of the court, uh, nor the jurisdiction of uh, the uh, commission to deal with individual applications. So the, the consequences for the system were not dramatic. The consequences of the system, for, for the system uh, uh, were um, minimal, so to say. Um, there is another twist I would like also to, to highlight. The fact that the court uh, chooses the date of the 16th of March. The, the court is not choosing, it's not mentioning the 15th of March, which is the date of uh, the denunciation. It mentions the 16th of March, which is the date of the expulsion from the Council of Europe with uh, a decision by the Committee of Ministers. So the court prefers to deal with the whole issue under uh, the uh, paragraph of Article 58 dealing with uh, uh, the cessation of membership of the Council of Europe, rather than to see the whole issue as an issue of denunciation of the European Convention of Human Rights. The, cho the choice of the day is quite telling. It is 16 March, not 15 March. This symbolically is meaningful. It means something. It is not by chance uh, that the court has not uh, chosen the 15th of March. Another small detail, but uh, it will not perhaps be so small, is that um, uh, the resolution of the European Court of Human Rights uh, says that according um, uh, to uh, uh, the relevant provisions, the Russian Federation um, sorry, uh, according to the relevant provision, it will continue to deal with cases of alleged violations committed up until the 16th of September. The violations, the alleged violations have to be committed up until the 16th of uh, September, meaning that if you add the four months for the, uh, the, the former six months rule, now fourth months rule after the entry into force of the 15th protocol, uh, the court might take cases up until the 16th of January, 2023, which adds uh, to what Marco has said. To the challenges. I mean, it is plausible that the court will, will have to deal with thousands and thousands of cases uh, during all those months. And uh, uh, of course, there's another challenge, and this is the execution challenge. Um, nobody has spoken up until now about the fact that the Committee of Ministers is the, uh, the body which is competent to supervise the execution of judgments given by the European Court of Human Rights. 
Uh, and I'm wondering how on earth the uh, committee's ministers is going to exercise this function without probably the participation of uh, the Russian Federation, uh, how practically those cases will be closed at the level of execution, uh, when and if they will be they will be dealt with by the court. So there is there is a challenge not only for the a huge challenge not only for the court but also for the whole machinery of the European Convention on Human Rights, including the Committee uh, of Ministers. Um, I would like also to mention uh, challenges to the uh, issues of uh, migrants and refugees uh, uh, and to uh, uh, give you, Maria, the possibility to advertise your excellent initiative uh, on those issues. Um, and I would like also to mention that uh, 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 within EU law, we are a bit uh, uh, further on, we are entering EU law, but uh, um, this is perhaps inescapable. Uh, we have the activation for the first time of the directive on provisional uh, protection. And this is also a tremendous shift in the whole debate concerning refugees, asylum seekers in Europe, the principle of solidarity and so on. This is another challenge for all European states. Uh, it is also a challenge for the European Union and perhaps it will uh, um, uh, change the whole, the whole scenario and the whole approach of uh, uh, the uh, um, refugee and asylum seekers uh, uh, issue within the e European uh, Union. So I would like just to, to mention this because, because uh, it is also a, an international law issue, the refugees and asylum seekers, of course, and we are, um, let us say, in, in, in an area which is both international law and uh, EU law and uh, the relationship between those bodies, uh, those two bodies of law. And uh, of course, we have institutional changes. So I have mentioned already the Committee of Ministers and the European Court, but I'd like also to, to raise the, the issue of the challenges uh, for, for the Council of Europe as a whole, as an organization. Uh, this is a new era for the uh, Council of Europe. Um, you remember that uh, back in 1996, the then uh, um, uh, uh, Secretary General, uh, um, uh, was expressing uh, doubts, uh, uh, um, uh, alternate Secretary General was expressing doubts about the, the entry and the acceptance of uh, the Russian Federation to the Council of Europe. And uh, um, those, those doubts uh, um, are, um, have affected the, the whole debate, let us say, up until now. And uh, I would like also to recall the problems uh, um, raised with the finances of the organization two, three years ago when the Russian Federation was, uh, was partially suspended and refused to pay its contribution uh, to the budget of uh, the Council of Europe. So we have challenges ahead for the, the finances of the uh, Council of Europe, but more broadly for the whole physiognomy of uh, the organization not to mention the uh, challenges for the OAC, who is quite discreet, I must say, uh, in, this, in this whole crisis. Uh, so these are uh, my, my uh, reactions, uh, very spontaneous, I must say, reactions to uh, uh, Professor Milanovic's um, excellent introduction. Of course, I'm, I'm keen to, to hear from him again and uh, eventually from other participants. And uh, um, thank you so much, Marie. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Sicilianos. Indeed, you have all realized uh, by now that uh, when we were talking about international law, uh, we were actually meaning international law. There's just about everything thrown in. Um, there's also another major challenge here, uh, uh, the challenge of instruments created at peacetime for peacetime that need to be adjusted uh, in the circumstances of war. And that entails all kinds of challenges from budgetary to uh, just simply questions of evidence. Uh, 
so it, it is really uh, an issue there. I would bypass the discussion about refugees because I would keep that for the end. For the time being, um, uh, Marco, uh, um, it's not a rebuttal. I think it's an exchange of views. And I would actually welcome both of you in sort of a direct uh, communication before I turn to the audience. Sure. Uh, Sure. So uh, thank you so much, Alexander, for, for all of this. So, so let me uh, re reflect on three points uh, that, that, that you made. First of all, I think you very correctly pointed to Karim Khan's sort of uh, uh, role in, 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 in starting and managing the appearance and, 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 and actual implementation of the ICC investigation. There's a performative aspect to being a prosecutor of an international court. And he made a very good decision to signal, to be visible, to be there with hope, some kind of measure of hope that you know, a deterrent effect will be emanated from that. And that human suffering will be perhaps just a teeny tiny bit mitigated. Now we have no way of knowing whether this will work or not, but I think he did the right thing. And sometimes, even though I am very skeptical towards you know, the possibility of prosecuting high value, high ranking Russian officials, sometimes even extremely unlikely things do happen. Milosevic did end up in The Hague. The entire leadership of Serbia, my country, did end up in The Hague. Now, Serbia is a teeny tiny pathetic little state you know, compared to Russia. But still, if you ask somebody in Serbia, is this likely, is this going to happen? They will all say it's not never going to happen, but it did happen. So we shall find out. Now, the deterrent effect is important for, for one more big reason, which is that Ukraine needs to behave too. It's not just Russia that is or Russian soldiers doing potentially bad things in Ukraine. It's also the other way around. You know, Ukrainian soldiers need to respect the rights of Russian prisoners of war, for example. I mean, you have seen this video yesterday or the day before, which has not been verified, but is plausible, of Ukrainian soldiers shooting captured Russian soldiers in the knees, in the legs, yeah? We have before that seen issues of, I don't know, Russian POWs being paraded on social media. So the Karim Khan signal is not just directed towards Russia, it is also directed to Ukraine. And that's, by the way, where we will find most prosecutions. In the sort of reasonably optimistic scenario of this unfolding, which is that Ukraine maintains the statehood and institutions and so on in some way, remember that Ukraine probably has thousands of Russian prisoners of war in captivity. At least some of these people will be prosecuted by Ukrainian courts for war crimes they committed in Ukraine. I don't know what's the highest ranking person they captured, probably some colonel, you know, but they will be prosecuted. And we will see how Ukraine does this, assuming again that Ukraine survives this war, which seems not unlikely at this stage, yeah. So uh, that's the ICL aspect. So don't forget prosecutions in Ukraine and potentially in other countries as well where mid to lower ranking perpetrators might be found. On the genocide insert before the ICJ, the big danger there is really attempting to pigeonhole aggression and use of bellum in bellow issues through a very narrow jurisdictional lens, like the genocide convention, like the convention of racial discrimination. CERD of course is much broader than the genocide convention. So CERD at least can work in that respect. Um, so, plus then there's all the, the, the limitations of the ICJ as an institution. The fact that it'll take 10 years to decide this case. The fact that it has no fact-finding capability, right? So all of this means that really the point of this was provisional measures. It was to send a symbolic message. Russia is not even appearing. Russia is disrespecting the court, disrespecting the UN. That's what Ukraine wanted to achieve. It achieved it. What happens later at the jurisdiction and merit spaces honestly is, is relatively trivial compared to what Ukraine really wanted. And what Ukraine wanted, it got. You know, and that's really the provisional measures. Finally, on the jurisdiction extraterritoriality issue under the convention. 
where, where obviously Alexander and I sort of disagree probably uh, the most. Um, I agree with the basic idea that in situations of active combat, you cannot have control over territory as a stable basis for jurisdiction. But I don't agree that control over the person of the victim of the human rights violation by a state agent is inapplicable in that type of scenario, which is what the court basically said in Georgia, Russia. Yeah, because that argument depends on what we mean by control over the victim. So in my view, Alexander, if the British intelligence services, GCHQ, right now as we're speaking, hacked your phone and took all of your private data from your phone, in my view, that is enough of control over you for your right to privacy to apply. If a British or James Bond type assassin goes abroad and kills somebody, at the moment they're killing the person, they're controlling them for the purpose of the right to life. By the way, who agrees with me? The European Court of Human Rights agrees with me in the Carter versus Russia judgment, was it six months ago, when the court found that Russia assassinating Alexander Litvinenko in London meant that the European Convention applied. Now, the way oh. this was done is to say, well, it's just one guy being killed and then the right to life applies. But is it in any kind of plausible way justifiable to say, if you kill one person, the right to life applies, but if you kill a thousand people, the right to life does not apply. If you kill them with poison, you know, you put radioactive stuff in their tea, the European Convention applies. But if you shell them with a, a rocket propelled grenade or whatever, then the, the right to life doesn't. I don't think these distinctions make sense. So I haven't, I, I, I agree with you betting on what the European court will do is, is, is not an easy thing to do, probably not a wise thing to do. But morally and legally, I don't think this position Georgia Russia too was sustainable. Even though I agree with you, it is Bank which continued. It is Alskani, Bank which all, it, it, is, it is not a departure from the court's previous position. It is the reinforcement of the court's previous position. But let's wait and see. Further excitement awaits us. Uh, Lino, I don't know whether you would uh, like to come back to any of those points before I just turn to our audience. Uh, uh, I was uh, searching, thank you so much, uh, Marco and Maria. I was searching in my notes and, and now I found the, the paragraph of the resolution of the European Court of Human Rights concerning future cases. And it says, and I quote, the court remains competent to deal with applications directed against the Russian Federation in relation to acts or omissions capable of constituting a violation of the convention, provided that they, the violations, occurred until 16 September 2022. The violations, the alleged violations occurred until 16 September, meaning that plus four months, you can have cases introduced uh, uh, applications submitted to the court up until the 16th of January, 2023. There may be um, years even, if people are exhausting remedies in Russia, it might be three years from now. E even, even, even further on. Uh, but of course it will be difficult to exhaust uh, such remedies, uh, I, I suppose. But, but yes, you're right. Consider them futile right. and they will yes, just move on. Yes, yes, theoretically you, you are right. Uh, so uh, the the challenge is there, and uh, and uh, yes, uh, um, I'm very curious to see how this will be uh, resolved. Um, yes, for, for the rest, I, I don't have anything to add to what Marco has just said, but I'm of course at the disposal of uh, any possible questions from from uh, um, the audience. Okay, so while our audience uh, is thinking about raising their hand and asking a question, I do have a question that comes from YouTube. Uh, it does not touch very much um, upon uh, the present discussion because it refers to sanctions. Um, and the question is, um, are sanctions imposed to individuals such as professional athletes considered uh, to be... Um, uh, legal even though they are considered these persons are considered associates of the gov of the russian government or persons of influence in the russian government 
um, you haven't really discussed that. Uh, but again, that is another parameter uh, that really brings uh, the whole discussion into uh, into difficult issues of international law. And I think that once again, we see how all aspects are explored uh, with this uh, conflict, uh, with this invasion, really. Um, there is also another question. Again, I'm, I'm uh, reading from the chat. With regards to refugees, why do some countries like Poland allow uh, Ukrainian refugees to work uh, during their stay, while normally refugees from other war zones like Syria or Afghanistan have no rights to work? Yes, there is a reason. Uh, Petro Mihailivi, I can answer that. That is actually the temporary protection uh, directive that comes into force. Uh, and that's the first time that we do see uh, this um, uh, uh, instrument being applied. I cannot say that I share uh, the optimism of uh, Lino Sicilianos uh, as to its impact in the overall discussions about the uh, asylum and migration pact in the European Union. Uh, if only it were that simple. Um, we have um, realized that there is um, a kind of a curve. People are very welcoming in the first days. And as time goes by, uh, that uh, initial uh, welcome becomes less and less emotional. And at the end of the day, it might even arise to uh, even move into elements of uh, xenophobia. Um, and, and that is a very, very uh, disquieting trajectory. Uh, we're running a project on that and we'll let you know as soon as we figure it out. But I do have two hands. Danai um, uh, and Aix Papastavridis, may I go to ladies first? <laughs> the night so, uh, yes, thank you very much. If you and could I would switch on your camera, that would be fine. Ah, okay, yeah, hold on. Yeah, can you you can see me, right? Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for organizing this. And thank you also for the time that the speakers dedicate. It's a very, very interesting discussion. Um, I wanted to ask about extraterritoriality. Uh, personally, I always, uh, sorry for this. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah. So I, I always found the approach of the European Court of Human Rights uh, very limiting. And this fixation with uh, the territorial control and fixation with physical control when it came over the individual. We have the recent case of the CRC committee, uh, obviously on environmental law, but where actually the CRC committee does follow this more functional model of uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction, where it did accept that a state, an, a, um, um, it will fall within the jurisdiction of the state uh, on the basis of the capacity to exercise a right. So if uh, there is an act interfering with the capacity to exercise a right um, and this act emanates uh, from the state territory, then the protection of this right will fall within the state's jurisdiction. Uh, now, this was on environmental law, I'm aware of this, but I wanted to ask the speakers uh, if they see the European Court of Human Rights uh, following up that path of the CRC. Um, and ob obviously it will have wider implications, uh, but uh, what, what their reaction to that be? Do they see merit, like this see a future <laughs> of the European Court of Human Rights actually opening up to territorial control? No, thank you, this is my question. So any feedback that would like so to much, give me to this? Thank you so much, then I turn to Marco first. Okay, thanks. So, so let me deal with, with all the, 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 the three questions uh, sort of in the, in the order. So when it comes to sanctions against athletes, and we can expand this also sanctions against uh, artists, um, you know, private Russian citizens in various different respects, the, the big issue is what do we mean by a sanction, right? So often you will simply have private companies um, disentangling themselves from some kind of contractual obligation. And then the issue really is not one of, 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 of international law. It's a purely domestic law issue with some international element. When the Munich Philharmonic says to Valery Gergiev, the, the, the Russian conductor, go away, we're not going to pay you X million euros anymore because you love Putin, he can sue them in contract. Okay. The issue of, of, of sanctions, however, more broadly, 
is really of, of huge importance. And as, as you can see, uh, while 144 states in the General Assembly condemned Russia's aggression, only a fraction of them have actually imposed sanctions against Russia. And that's because a lot of the world is uncomfortable with sanctions, sometimes for purely selfish reasons, because they don't want to harm their economies, sometimes for reasons of principle, because sanctions ultimately will punish ordinary Russians. And one huge question of principle is to what extent, and I'm, I'm not saying this is legal, at least not rigorously legal, you know, to what extent is the collective punishment of ordinary Russians appropriate in this type of situation? And I don't have a clear answer for this. To some extent, the ordinary Russian individual has to suffer the consequences of what their state does, but only to some extent. And we can see how sanctions have produced horrible consequences in places like Cuba or Iran in, in ways that are difficult to justify in human rights terms. For example, if a state is unable to, pro to procure medical equipment and drugs for its population, that's very difficult to justify as, as legally, I would say. Uh, the second issue on refugees, I agree with Maria as you're the refugee expert with everything you said, but I would add there's one other explanation. And that's a teeny tiny smidgen of racism and xenophobia. Yeah? That same Poland that generally embraced its neighbors from Ukraine. But not the foreign students. Not the foreign students, especially if they're from Africa. Not the, the, the people who Belarus has been weaponizing to send them into Poland. Right? So we, we, you know, we need to be real here. Right? So as you said, there is that curve of acceptance and xenophobia. We will see what happens. The big danger here is that there's no real burden sharing. If all these millions of people stay in Poland and very few of them are taken by other European states, especially if the situation in Ukraine persists to be bad for a very long time. You know? So, I mean, this can, this can lead to a, 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 a bad situation, but we'll, we shall see. Deny about your extraterritoriality question. The answer is simply, I don't know what the court will do, but all of the other human rights bodies from the Inter-American Court to the Human Rights Committee, the, com the Committee on the Rights of the Child, all of them are taking more expansive and expansive approaches to this question of extraterritoriality. And the European Court has always been and is increasingly being an outlier. And something I am confident reasonably will push it in the right direction. Partly it's the Ukraine war, maybe it's climate change, maybe it's surveillance, God knows. But I think there will be a, a need for them to move to a more expansive direction. Not that that expansive direction is not without dangers and confusion. If you look at the decisions on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and for example, duty to rescue child, children from Syrian camps, or the, 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 the decision of the Human Rights Committee on the duty to rescue drowning migrants in the Mediterranean, you will see that when it comes to positive obligations in particular, they are all tied up in knots because they don't know where a reasonable line can be drawn. So we shall see. But I, I think, you know, bottom line, the European Court is an outlier and they will be moving, I think, in the right direction. When? To, I don't know. But to play devil's advocate here, uh, the European Court of Human Rights does accept, does receive the huge number of applications, nothing as compared uh, to that is actually present in all the other instances, uh, judicial and quasi-judicial. So there are other uh, considerations in place as well. Lino, would you like a comment here before I turn to Akis? Well, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I would like, yes, to, to recall the distinction between uh, global sanctions and uh, smart sanctions. And of course, I uh, uh, agree with uh, what uh, Marco has said. Uh, interestingly uh, enough, if you are a Russian citizen living in, uh, uh, for instance, within the Schengen area, then you can move and come to Greece and give a concert on the 1st of April uh, in two days with the National Orchestra of Greece without any problem. 
Um, and uh, I invite uh, those uh, Greeks bearing with me to come and see that concert because it will be an extraordinary one. But uh, this is uh, by, uh, by way of anecdote. Uh, now, um, of course, we know that um, as far as smart sanctions are concerned, there has been a huge uh, case law uh, going back uh, to the Cadi case before the um, European Court of Justice. Uh, and uh, up to the Aldulimi case uh, before the, the um, European Court of Human Rights. But in those cases, we had to deal with sanctions uh, decided uh, uh, by the UN Security Council. And we had to deal with the whole argument about uh, Article 103 of the UN Charter and the obligations of uh, uh, national organs, including uh, national tribunals, to uh, uh, abide by, uh, by the resolutions of the UN Security Council. Uh, here, for obvious reasons, we do not have to, um, uh, to deal with uh, sanctions uh, uh, decided by the uh, UN Security Council. So the whole problematic will not be exactly the same. If uh, one or the other case uh, comes before a national tribunal and then possibly, why not, before a European uh, tribunal or another uh, um, treaty body, then uh, the terms of uh, the, uh, any possible litigation will not be exactly the same as the ones we know up until now, given this structural difference. We do not deal now with, uh, with uh, um, smart sanctions decided uh, on the basis of a blacklist uh, um, of the UN Security Council. Uh, we are dealing with either with retortions or with uh, countermeasures in the in the true sense, the technical sense of the terms, uh, by so-called third states. Uh, so um, we, I'm, I'm very curious to see how possible uh, cases of that sort will be dealt with, uh, both by national and eventually by by international and European. Uh, the judicial and quasi-judicial uh, organs. Now, um, of course, as far as the refugee issue is concerned, uh, I agree with uh, you, Marianne, when you say that at the, uh, the beginning you have a, 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 a sentimental approach, so to say, which, which is uh, psychologically understandable, and then uh, the approach is changing. And I, we all recall the situation in Greece back in 2015 and the situation now uh, 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 in Greece again. Uh, we don't have the same feelings now as uh, we had in 2015. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, Polish government and Polish people and Hungarians will perhaps rethink about the principle of sharing of burden in those uh, uh, situations and about the principle of solidarity. And this is a principle which is invoked by Greece in a very different scenario, like the, 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 the um, Syrian scenario and other similar scenarios in, in the past, in the, the 2015 scenario and so on. And we have to uh, see the global, the big picture. And I hope that some of uh, EU member states, which uh, were a bit uh, um, adamant against uh, uh, the principle of solidarity with the actual crisis will uh, rethink about their position in this respect. That's why I'm a bit uh, uh, more optimist than, than you, Maria. But of course, we shall see. Um, uh, finally, as far as extraterritorial- Maybe after the French elections, presumably. Also, this is, this is also an element. This is also a factor. Um, about extraterritoriality and environmental issues, I, I, uh, I am aware of a big, big case pending before the European Court of Human Rights directed against a number of uh, uh, member states of the Council of Europe. We shall see how this goes. But um, if it goes ahead and the court decides to, uh, to uh, uh, resolve, let us say, possibly and positively resolve uh, uh, the victim requirement issue and go into the jurisdictional issues and then into the merits, possibly this will be a tremendous case 
uh, of worldwide importance. And uh, then, of course, uh, the, the issue of um, uh, extraterritorial application in, in an environmental scenario uh, will have to be dealt with. So uh, let us let us wait and see what uh, will happen with with this uh, with this particular case. And it is interesting, thank if you. I may add to that, and thank you, Lina, is that uh, the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions has also submitted uh, an amicus curiae on that element of extraterritoriality and jurisdiction, exactly because this is the, really the crux of the matter. Aki, you have been waiting very patiently, and I do have one more question, or rather a serious, one more issue raised a, 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 on uh, chat, and then we need to wrap up our discussion. Aki. Thanks, this, they say patience is the greatest virtue, right? Uh, so many thanks for, for your uh, very interesting presentation and exchange of views. So my, my question concerns Yusin Bello, maybe directly Yusin Bello, and, but it has to do with some which you did not address. And the thing is, is uh, and also like it's an elephant in the room, is they're all of the third states, right? So, uh, you know, UK, other states are providing weapons, uh, Greece, including intelligence to Ukraine, are they acting in collective defense? Uh, this is probably my personal view that they are, you know, if you do the, um, the majority, if you can use force, you can actually use adminus, you can provide weapons, right? Uh, but I would like to hear your views. I don't know if the if these states have actually uh, sent a report to the Security Council uh, that they are exercising collective defense yeah. as per Article 51. Uh, I, I hardly think so. If not, if they're not exercising collective defense, right? Uh, what about, uh, you know, another uh, concept of the national law called neutrality? Uh, is it... Are we using countermeasures to actually defend the, the you know, the violation of neutrality? Uh, and also, Professor Donopoulos uh, must be here, who wrote a, 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 you know, a book on neutrality very recently. I haven't read it uh, yet. So I'd like to hear views on these two topics. Thank you. Uh, Marco? Thanks so much, Aki. So, so um, this is a hugely important question. Um, I will confess that I, I am not sure, I don't know what the right reasoning is, but I know what the right outcome is, okay? So the right outcome is that the supply of weapons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, intelligence and so on by all third states to Ukraine must be lawful. Now, how we get to that outcome is a more complicated question. Like you, I find it quite plausible to say that to the extent they are violating any rule of international law in providing this kind of assistance, the wrongfulness of that violation is precluded by resort to collective self-defense. Legally, every state in the world can at Ukraine's request today start bombing Russian troops in Russia. Yeah? America has the right at Ukraine's request to bomb Moscow tomorrow. The reason why they're not doing it is because of escalation to nuclear war, not because they're not legally allowed to do it. Yeah. So if they're legally allowed to actively help Ukraine in fighting against Russia, they must be allowed to provide it with weapons. Now, the problem is how to justify that in terms of neutrality. The problem here is that, as you know, international law is some kind of cake that grows layer by layer, and then we don't know what to do with things that are 100 years old and that are really bad fit with the modern law of the UN Charter. So some people say, well, the law of neutrality simply makes no sense in, the, in 2022. Other people will say, well, we can use qualified neutrality, which is essentially boiling down to the same thing, you know, that you have the right to help the victim of aggression and you don't have the right to help the aggressor, which is you know, very similar. So I, I, I don't know which of these routes one takes, but that must be the right answer that what they're doing is legal. You know? Um, yes, I basically agree with, with Marco as far as I know, but uh, of course uh, I may miss something. I have not heard uh, an explicit 
um, invocation of the argument based on collective self-defense. And I have not seen uh, uh, a formal notification to the UN Security Council making that argument. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm not aware of all the, the, the official, the official uh, um, uh, letters sent very recently to the UN Security Council, but, but I have not heard something about that. So uh, for the time being, uh, the argument based on collective self-defense has not been vocally made, uh, to put it like that. Uh, but of course, it is, it is an argument. It is an argument uh, uh, which uh, uh, presupposes um, a demand from the uh, victim of aggression, namely Ukraine, which uh, in most cases exists, is there. Uh, there has been a request, a formal request for help. So uh, this basic condition uh, for the activation of collective self-defense is there. And then you have also necessity and you have the immediate character of the response. So you have the elements of, of uh, collective self-defense highlighted by, including by the International Court of Justice in a number of cases, beginning with the uh, Nicaragua case again. Yeah. Um, what about uh, countermeasures? Um, I, I have written a contribution in the seminal book uh, edited by James Crawford and, and Alain Pellet on uh, state responsibility entitled uh, Countermeasures by Not Directly um, uh, uh, Affected States. And in this contribution, I try to make the point that uh, uh, there is a, a customary rule into, into this effect, uh, to that effect, and uh, that we should not take into account only the practice of a, a limited uh, um, circle of states. We have to see the broad picture. And uh, I have added a number of uh, examples uh, trying to, to justify my position, examples we have, which have not been uh, mentioned by the International Law Commission in the commentary of uh, uh, Article 54, if my memory serves me correctly, of the uh, Arsiva, the Articles on, on, on State Responsibility, uh, concerning not countermeasures, but simply measures adopted by, by uh, uh, not directly uh, affected states. So uh, yes, uh, I think that this is also a plausible argument. How this argument is related to neutrality, I think that we have a great specialist in, in this, uh, uh, in our chat, namely uh, Professor Andonopoulos, uh, published, uh, who published recently with uh, Cambridge University Press, the book you refer to, Akis, and uh, he's with us, and perhaps he would like to react. Well, I'm looking forward to that, to be very frank, but I don't... Uh, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, yeah, excellent. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Milanovic and Sicilianos, for your um, uh, comments and... Uh, um, the views you have expressed. And uh, um, thank you very much for inviting me to comment on this. Uh, even though uh, the law of neutrality is really uh, literally more than 100 years old, uh, at least more than 100 years old, uh, it is still relevant. Uh, and it uh, uh, constitutes a uh, uh, part of most uh, national military manuals, for instance. Um, of course, every state has uh, uh, the right to, um, uh, on its own assessment of a uh, situation, to react to an armed conflict uh, waged uh, uh, between um, or among others. Uh, but uh, uh, the decision uh, it makes uh, does affect uh, its um, uh, rights and duties under the law of neutrality. Uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, the commentary to um, Article 4 of Geneva Convention 1 expressly states that the law of neutrality applies uh, with respect to non-participants in an armed conflict. And um, uh, non-participant is basically status, and uh, it uh, brings uh, the non-participant under an umbrella of rights and obligations. Now, to the point is, um, um, 
whether uh, uh, countermeasures uh, go as far as um, uh, boosting the fighting capacity of either belligerent. If that happens, then there is an issue uh, about um, uh, complying with um, obligations under the law of neutrality. Uh, one may invoke uh, the evolution um, uh, with respect to the prohibition on uh, the use of force or the United States practice at the beginning of the Second World War uh, about um, 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 Entitlement, an entitlement to take um, uh, countermeasures against an aggressor, but this is not opposable to um, the other belligerent, in this case, Russia. It, it, it has the right to treat it as a violation of neutrality on the part of third states and take its own countermeasures as a belligerent. And um, my view is that uh, even if this entails the use of force on the part of an agreed belligerent because of a violation of neutrality, it has nothing to do with the use at bellow. It is uh, within the use in bellow because neutrality is a, a, a part of the armed conflict. It, can, it cannot exist without it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Costa, uh, and uh, very well done uh, on, on the new book. And thank you, Akis, on that. Um, we need to wrap up uh, at some uh, point, I think. So very, very quickly, I will exercise my uh, privilege as um, chair of this meeting and uh, uh, direct a question first to Linus and then to Marco. Uh, Professor Marcello Di Filippo uh, suggests that perhaps all these cases brought to court by um, uh, Ukrainians and Russians, all these Russian cases, quotation marks, uh, could actually be dealt with the, with a pilot judgment procedure. That might be realistic, that might be the appropriate perhaps uh, procedure for this kind of thing. And then I would turn to both of you, but I would ask um, Marco to have the final word for a question that has been put by Yue Kao. I hope that I pronounce your, your name direct, uh, correctly with my apologies. And the question is um, whether we do have uh, in, in view of uh, uh, Ukraine's litigation in the ICJ a situation of a parallel dispute, uh, a parallel dispute of use at Bellum uh, that might have actually an impact on the ju course jurisdiction of a Ukraine's genocide convention based litigation. And um, the uh, UECAO suggests that there are three options possible. The first one is to uh, consider use at Bellum uh, an issue of treaty interpretation that does not affect the court's jurisdiction following, in essence, oil platforms. The second is to uh, go back to certain German interests and regard uh, the use of the discussion an incidental issue uh, and move accordingly. And the third one, of course, is to go back to the Aegean Sea continental shelf and the recently the Chagos uh, discussions and reject jurisdiction uh, over the issue under the compromissory clause. So opinions, suggestions, whatnot. Linus first, and then Marco. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to deal mainly on the, uh, with the question uh, uh, concerning pilot judgments. Well, of course, this procedure uh, relates exclusively to uh, individual applications, according to Article 61 of the Rules of Court. It does not concern the interstate application. So uh, interstate applications is another kind of cases, in another category, completely different uh, scenario. Uh, so pilot judgments uh, uh, and the pilot procedure, um, yes, this could theoretically be a possibility. Of course, uh, uh, if the court decides to follow that procedure, then it has to eventually communicate uh, uh, those cases under the pilot uh, procedure uh, provided for in the rules of court. Um, and uh, of course, another solution uh, would be uh, to, uh, if um, some of them or a number of them are, are inadmissible cases, to send them to a single judge. Uh, 
Um, it depends how the court uh, will deal with the uh, extraterritoriality issue. Uh, if the court applies um, the Georgia versus Russia II uh, paradigm, then uh, a number of uh, uh, possible applications uh, will be declared uh, uh, inadmissible and decided by a single judge. So uh, uh, the pilot judgment procedure uh, presupposes that the court uh, communicates those cases, meaning in practical purposes that the court uh, thinks that those cases are uh, uh, have, have good chances uh, to go ahead. Uh, so we shall see. Uh, nothing can be can be said uh, definitely at this stage. But yes, the, the possibility is there. Um, there are structural issues, of course. Uh, um, if the uh, the court decides to go ahead with those cases, and yes, the pilot uh, judgment procedure could be uh, used so as to uh, to group. Um, those cases or uh, to, to, to classify possible cases under various groups. And that's what the, the court has already done in respect of uh, the thousands of individual applications, not only uh, in this scenario, in the relationship between um, uh, Ukraine and Russia, but also in the relationship between, uh, between Georgia and Russia, and also the thousands of cases concerning Armenia and Azerbaijan. So there has been a stock taking and then a classification and then uh, possibly the pilot judgment procedure will be followed for those cases which are uh, um, uh, communicated under this procedure um, to, the, to the respondent states. So yes, there are precedents. And uh, as far as the, the interstate applications is concerned, I would like to mention the adoption three years ago uh, of uh, four years ago, actually, I was by the time a co-rapporteur of um, uh, an important report on the, the, the way to go uh, as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible with interstate applications. And this was, this is an official document. Uh, you can find it on the side of the court and uh, at least uh, uh, in a redacted form. And uh, uh, this document has also been discussed uh, um, within the framework of the CDDA. So there are, there are developments uh, uh, in relationship, uh, uh, in relation to the dealing, to the, the, the handling of interstate cases. Uh, the fact, for instance, that the court has merged uh, uh, some of those uh, interstate applications, uh, especially uh, in the relationship between uh, Ukraine and Russia, is, is indicative of the will of the court to go uh, ahead as, as fast as possible. But of course, those cases are raising huge issues of evidence you have uh, mentioned before, Maria, and rightly so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Marco? So uh, just very quickly on the first question of the European court, I mean, basically what, what Alexander just said, the court needs to plan this out. But the pile of judgment is just but a tool in the toolkit that the court has, but it needs to have a strategy on how to deal with all these cases, which by the way, remember, will include not just the conflict related stuff, but all the normal cases against Russia that are still pending, sure. all the cases brought against Russia by Russians in Russia, so all the media organizations that were just shut down, Novaya Gazeta, who, you know, they filed a case against Russia immediately, they got interim measures, right? So all, all of that stuff, the court will need to plan out. The basic point is this, states need to give the court money, resources, people. No matter of how, how much efficiency and planning the court does, they cannot handle this without more money, without people. It can't be done. And if states are smart, that's what they will do. If they don't do that, we're going to have a, a big strategic problem for the European court as a whole, simply because they will not have resources to deal with this adequately, right? And that's what states must do. And it's peanuts compared to Not to, to mention, the Marco, money. the fact that there are 40 lawyers, Russian lawyers now serving the court. What's going to happen with them? Exactly, exactly. Many of them on temporary contracts so they cannot continue, right? You know, some of them maybe work for KGB. Most of them don't, right? So you need to retain Russian speakers. You need to retain knowledge. I didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. So that's like the big important thing. Um, I mean, like one missile, one missile launcher that the, the 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 Brits and the French and whoever are sending 
to, to, to Ukraine on an everyday basis is what will sustain the European court for, for, I don't know, a year. You know what I mean? Like it's it's so little money compared to the money the West, Western states are already spending to spend to, to, to help Ukraine. They must invest this in the European court. They simply must. Otherwise, the European court will be an existential crisis simply because of lack of resources. On the second po uh, uh, point by UA, so I think you have all of the three types of arguments you make are plausible. If you look at the dissenting opinion of, of, the, of the Russian and Chinese judges on the provisional measure stage, they are perfectly reasonable, plausible opinions. Yeah, it's very easy. If you're an international lawyer to argue on the jurisdictional phase of the case, listen, what you're really doing is you said, Bellum, it's not about genocide, just go away. Mm -hmm. Judge Benuna basically said this. Now, he said, I'm, I'm voting for provisional measures because I'm in a moral crisis. But hello, when it comes to jurisdiction, I'm going to say no jurisdiction. Fine. But, you know, we shall see what the court will do because other avenues are also plausible. So it's a sort of indeterminacy where every judge will pick one of the three options you outlined. And they will pick that option on the basis of many other things, not just their view of international law. Right. Um, an interesting issue would be if you separate out the use of bellum point completely. If state A accuses state B of committing genocide falsely, is that in and of itself grounds for invoking the genocide convention? So if, if Serbia accused Croatia of committing genocide, for example, can Croatia sue Serbia simply for a declaratory judgment to say, no, we never committed genocide? There's no force. Yeah. So I, you know, that, that, that's an interesting point that we shall see. Uh, uh, how the court will deal with on both, both jurisdiction and the merits. Excellent. So we'll see how it goes. And what about the parallel? Um... It could it could very well be that the court will say, "Listen, we will we have jurisdiction for the false claim of genocide, but we don't have jurisdiction over the use of force aspect because it's not fundamentally about the genocide convention." It's a very plausible approach to take. Uh, but remember, what Ukraine wanted is provisional measures. The point of coupling the use of force with the, the, the false statement about genocide is so that the court could order Russia to stop the war, which is what the court did. Everything else that happens afterwards is really bonus. You know, Ukraine doesn't need the court's judgment. The Ukraine got what it wanted. Well, I was commenting just the other day that it is absolutely incredible the way Ukraine is using every tool in the international law toolbox to, to present their case. And I was reminded of the fact that the foreign ministry of Ukraine is actually an international lawyer. So guys out there, oh, beware. <laughs> uh, you know, the future is there for you all. Um, thank a you. final word, Maria, if yes, I, I can Carmen, say, uh... yes, sorry, uh, before closing. Another challenge is the coordination between the ICJ and the European Court of Human Rights in respect of the interstate cases, of course, uh, because very similar issues or closely related issues are submitted here and there. And the danger is that perhaps some of those issues will be dealt in a different way. And, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is a danger, this is a challenge. Of course, uh, I can tell you that there is a communication, there are channels of communications between the two courts and that there have been uh, um, the mutual uh, uh, visits uh, at The Hague and in Strasbourg so as to uh, Accorder les violons respectifs, as uh, <laughs> we said by the time, the then president said, the then president of the European Court said. Uh, but, but in any case, it, it is a real challenge because it is, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it is the first time in, in uh, both courts' history that this is happening in such a prominent and, uh, and uh, uh, vocal, so to say, way. Huh? Um, yeah, in the in the Georgia versus Russia number one scenario, you remember that the uh, ICJ declined, uh, said that the case was inadmissible, and that the European Court of Human Rights was waiting the ICJ before going into the case. Uh, 
if you see the timeline, it is obvious that uh, um, the, 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 the European Court was waiting to see what the ICJ would say. Uh, in this scenario, it is, it is probably impossible to do exactly the same thing. So there will be parallel procedures and, and uh, the, the challenge for both courts is, is perhaps bigger. Yeah, I think for uh, all, insti all institutions involved, actually, and uh, I have no doubt that there would be quite a lot of, of uh, coming and throwing between uh, what we call, how do we call that, uh, judicial communication or judicial dialogue uh, have contributed to the volumes uh, <laughs> along those lines. So, um, uh, gentlemen, it's been almost two hours, um, way more than our usual uh, circumstances. Uh, so I would really, really like to thank you uh, both for this discussion. Um, Linus is one of our own, so, you know, I'm all, we're always... Thank you, Maria. Thank that you to around. Marco. Many thanks but to Marco. Marco, really, uh, you are one of our own of our heart. So there you are. Thank you so very much for being here. We had record numbers of attendance, I must tell you. We were actually kicking people away. So there, there you see. I mean, we have been <laughs> trying to accommodate everybody. We had record numbers also. Is that because you have a cheap version of Zoom, so you can't have more <laughs> attendance? Believe me, we pay out of our pockets for that. <laughs> uh, that's not to the dean. Uh, so there you are. But uh, we do have just about everything under the sun at your disposal, uh, including the sun next time around. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, really, uh, really appreciative of your presence and your contribution. Uh, and so good to, to see your friends around uh, the screen. Uh, good night, everyone. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Okay, now we should be...